Spring, 1943. World War II rages on, and the Japanese Empire's grip tightens over the South Pacific. Jock McLaren, a battle-hardened veteran, finds himself in the clutches of the enemy. Captured when Singapore fell to Japanese forces, the Australian Army officer is now bound for Burhala Island. It's a remote part of Japanese-occupied Malaysia, and a fate worse than death likely awaits him at the notorious Sandakan prison camp. By the war's end, the odds of escape or survival from Sandakan will be less than half of 1%. The infamous Sandakan on death marches will claim the lives of more Australian servicemen than any camp in history. In the end, there will be just six survivors from more than 2,000. Yet for Jock, surrender is not an option. At age 39, Jock stands as one of the oldest soldiers in the 8th Australian Division. His life, a tapestry of war, from a teenage soldier in the British Army to a fearless leader with a thick Scottish brogue, an insatiable thirst for action, and the skills of a seasoned veterinarian. More than a soldier, he is an unstoppable force, a man whose grit and resolve will soon become legendary. Jock must embark on a daring escape from not one but two POW camps to then join a guerrilla warfare group in the Philippines. He'll become the ultimate menace, pestering the Imperial Japanese Navy with endless surprise attacks before he can defy death with a self-performed appendectomy and before he can commandeer his ship to harass the enemy relentlessly, igniting their fury to the point of a colossal bounty on his head. Jock McLaren must first break free from the chains of Sandakan. Jock McLaren was born into the stark yet spirited landscape of the Scottish Highlands in 1902. His early fascination with the tales of valor and resilience passed down through generations of Scots was a precursor to his life's remarkable journey. At a young age, he was a restless adventure seeker, determined to see more than his small community. In the shadow of World War I, McLaren, driven by a mixture of youthful idealism and the weighty legacy of his homeland, found a way to enlist in the British Army's Seaforth Highlanders. This decision made, while he was possibly still under the legal age for enlistment at just 16, thrust him into the brutal realities of trench warfare on the Western Front. It was here, amid the mud and blood of Europe, that the foundations of his resilience, tactical acumen, and leadership were forged. After the war, McLaren sought new horizons, moving to Australia in the early 1920s. Settling in Brisbane, Queensland, he began a career far removed from the battlefields of Europe. His passion for animals led him to practice as a veterinarian. It was in Brisbane that McLaren's personal life began to flourish as well. He met Alice Smith, a local woman whose strength and character matched his own. They would soon marry and start a family. However, World War II's outbreak caused McLaren to return to service. This time, he joined the Australian Army, specifically Old Regiment, a unit that would play a crucial role in the Pacific theater. As the war progressed, McLaren's experience and skills from the previous global conflict became invaluable assets to his unit and the broader struggle against the Axis powers. By the fall of Singapore in 1942, McLaren had established himself as a soldier of considerable skill and resolve. His capture by Japanese forces marked the beginning of a new, even more challenging chapter in his life. Yet. The same qualities that had defined his early years, courage, ingenuity, and an unwavering spirit, were about to be tested in ways he could never have imagined. 1942, Jock McLaren is sent to Singapore Field Regiment, their mission to defend Singapore against the Japanese advance. Singapore, known as the Gibraltar of the East, faces an imminent threat. McLaren's unit arrives as part of the last reinforcements. The battle intensifies. Despite their efforts, Singapore surrenders. McLaren is among thousands captured. The defeat leads to a forced march into captivity. The prisoners, McLaren included, are taken to Changi POW camp. Conditions are dire, marking the start of a severe trial for all held within. Changi, notorious for its harsh conditions, becomes McLaren's first POW camp. The resilience of the prisoners, including McLaren, will be tested here. The fall of Singapore is one of the most significant victories of the Imperial Japanese military in the war. It was truly a wake-up call of the surging strength of the Axis powers. Jock likely underestimated the danger he was in as he was carried off to the hellscape that was Changi POW camp. All he could think about was how he could escape and get to fighting the enemy. McLaren, along with thousands, is marched into the camp that would claim the lives of thousands. Soldiers from Australia and other allied nations suffer extreme malnutrition, disease, and spirit-breaking despair. From the day he arrives, McLaren is already planning to make his escape. Along with two other prisoners from his unit, McLaren studies the camp's layout and the guards' routines. Night after night, he maps out the precise timings of patrols, identifying a crucial window when guard attention wanes. Jock notices a section of the perimeter fence, less scrutinized, hidden by the jungle's shadow. Their exit point is chosen for its cover and proximity to the jungle, offering immediate concealment. McLaren and the other prisoners craft tools 
from scavenged materials and prepare to make their move. They have meticulously sourced wire cutters from scrap metal, makeshift compasses, maps drawn from memory, and carefully saved food rations. Just days after their arrival at Changi POW camp, McLaren and his team make their move. As night falls and the camp sleeps, they cut through the fence and disappear into the Malaysian jungle. The three men navigate through dense foliage. After several days of intense hiking, they nearly make it to Kuala Lumpur, thanks to assistance from Chinese guerrillas and Malayan Chinese villagers. During this time evading the Japanese, he witnessed hundreds upon hundreds of dead Chinese men, women, and children who had suffered at the hands of the Japanese. Many of the dead had been tortured, their homes destroyed prior to being killed, and this realization raged inside Jock. Just as Jock and the two other escaped prisoners were nearing Malaysia's capital, they're stopped short of freedom by a group of Malays who alert Japanese soldiers. Soldiers captured again, now faces a brutal punishment for daring to escape. Back in the confines of a POW camp, Jock McLaren and his two fellow escapees face the dire consequences of their actions. The men are beaten, tortured, and later brought before a firing squad. But in a strange and unexpected turn of events, their captors decide not to execute them and instead send them back into the prison camp. Undeterred by the threat of execution, McLaren begins plotting another escape. Within the grim walls of his cell, McLaren's mind races, planning, strategizing. McLaren's preparations are meticulous. He becomes a model prisoner, a strategy to earn the trust of his captors and gain valuable freedoms within the camp, all while secretly laying the groundwork for his next escape. Opportunity arises when McLaren, along with 1,000 British and Australian soldiers, is selected for transfer to Sandakan camp in Borneo. While Jock knew Sandakan was more brutal, he also knew his chances for escape were also higher, especially during the transportation between camps. This is where things get interesting. Jock McLaren and other Allied forces POWs are transported by boat to Berhala Island, where Sandakan Prison is located. The conditions on board are harsh, overcrowded holds, scarce food and sweltering heat. Jock McLaren and a group of Australians execute an audacious plan of escape. The men jump aboard a boat stolen from a nearby leper colony, a place the Japanese soldiers avoided. This small craft became their lifeline as they embarked on a perilous journey, island hopping northward. With only a shovel for paddling, they covered more than 450 km. Their destination is Mindanao in the Philippines. Here, they encountered Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Fertig, an American reserve officer who had rallied a formidable guerrilla force against the Japanese, securing a stronghold deep in the jungle. Fertig's group had just achieved a significant milestone, establishing contact with the American military and confirming their resistance. The arrival of a submarine, dispatched to supply Fertig's guerrillas with weapons, medicine, and communications equipment, also offered a chance for the escapees to be evacuated. Though McLaren could have returned to safety, he chose to stay. Recognizing the strategic importance of Fertig's operations and driven by a relentless desire to contribute to the Allied effort, he kept fighting. McLaren took on roles as a reconnaissance patrol leader, coast watcher, and whaleboat captain, leveraging his unique skills and experience to bolster Fertig's guerrilla activities. Jock would battle the Japanese in countless guerrilla warfare skirmishes. On a remote patrol, Jock McLaren faced a life-threatening crisis. As a trained veterinarian, he diagnosed himself with appendicitis. He knew immediate action was essential. With no medical help in sight, McLaren prepared for self-surgery. He crafted sutures from coconut fibers, used a mirror strapped to his knee for visual guidance, and operated with a penknife devoid of any painkillers or anesthesia. His self-appendectomy took four and a half hours of agony to complete. Remarkably, just two days later, McLaren was back on his feet, evading the advancing Japanese forces. When McLaren proposed a daring assault, his unconventional commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Fertig, approved without hesitation. McLaren, alongside two Filipinos, navigated an eight-meter whaleboat, dubbed the Bastard, into a Japanese-controlled harbor. In broad daylight, they attacked with machine guns and mortars before making a daring escape, their slow speed belied by their audacious success. This feat wasn't a one-time endeavor. McLaren repeated the attack, forcing the Japanese to reallocate resources to defensive positions, reducing their patrol and anti-guerrilla efforts. McLaren played a pivotal role in preventing Japanese forces from nearing Fertig's base camp, launching raids and ambushing patrols. His transition from an ordinary man to an extraordinary guerrilla fighter underscores his adaptability and courage. His most impactful contribution came from coast watching near a Japanese port. Noticing a troop ship transferring soldiers, McLaren's report led to an American submarine sinking the vessel, 
a significant blow to Japanese forces. His actions severely disrupted Japanese operations, prompting them to place a substantial bounty on him, unaware of the irony given their own brutalities. In April 1945, McLaren was reassigned to Z Special Unit under Australian command. Before the 7th Division's amphibious assault on Balikpapan in July 1945, McLaren and four others were parachuted into the jungle for reconnaissance. Despite landing injuries and an ambush that resulted in casualties, McLaren's team completed their mission, providing vital intelligence on Japanese positions. McLaren's final wartime operation saw him lead a reconnaissance mission in Borneo, further showcasing his leadership and guerrilla warfare skills. After the war, he contributed to re-establishing civilian administration in Borneo before returning to Australia in November 1945. From self-surgery in the jungle to spearheading guerrilla attacks, McLaren's story encapsulates the extraordinary lengths he went to serve the Allied cause. 